Hello, friends, and welcome to the Dimension of Our Midnight Cake, a weekly transmission from the Nexus of Realities. I'm Soltis, and joining me is my friend and fellow transdimensional being, Beaches. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> Lumberdor, Doug, and our special guest, my father Paka, seem to have all gotten lost somewhere in between the dimensions. Hopefully, they'll be able to join us as we proceed with our discussion. So, what is it we will be discussing this evening? I know I've been promising, and you have been waiting, for our intense analysis of idiocracy. But that will have to wait. This week, we will be discussing, in general terms, our opinions on The Lord of the Rings. This will be just a general overview in anticipation of Amazon's poor choices of bringing their fan fiction the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, to inflict the culture. For those of you who may be unfamiliar, The Lord of the Rings is an epic high fantasy novel by English author and scholar J.R.R. Tolkien. Set in Middle-earth, intended to be Earth at some time in the distant past, the story began as a sequel to Tolkien's 1937 children's book, The Hobbit, but eventually developed into a much larger work, Written in stages between 1937 and 1949, The Lord of the Rings is one of the best-selling books ever written, with over 150 million copies sold. The title refers to the main story's antagonist, the Dark Lord Sauron, who, in an earlier age, created the One Ring to rule the other rings of power given to men, dwarves, and elves in his campaign to conquer all of Middle-earth. From homely beginnings in the Shire, a hobbit land reminiscent of the English countryside, the story ranges across Middle-earth following the quest to destroy the One Ring, mainly through the eyes of the hobbits Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin. Although often called a trilogy, the work was intended by Tolkien to be one volume of a two-volume set along with a Silmarillion. For economic reasons, The Lord of the Rings was published over the course of a year from the 29th of July, 1954, to the 20th of October, 1955, in three volumes titled The Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King. The work is divided internally into six books, two per volume, with several appendices of background and material. Some later editions print the entire work in a single volume following the author's original intent. Tolkien's work, after an initially mixed reception by the literary establishment, has been the subject of extensive analysis of its themes and origins. Influences on his earlier work and the story of The Lord of the Rings include philology, mythology, Christianity, earlier fantasy works, and his own experiences in the First World War. The Lord of the Rings has since been reprinted many times and translated into at least 38 languages. Its enduring popularity has led to numerous references in popular culture, the founding of many societies by fans of Tolkien's work, and the publication of many books about Tolkien and his works. It has inspired many derivative works, including paintings, music, films, television, video games, and board games. It has helped to create and shape the modern fantasy genre within which it is considered one of the greatest books of all time. Award-winning adaptations of The Lord of the Rings have been made for radio, theater, and film. It has been named Britain's best novel of all time. And for some reason beyond my comprehension, Amazon wants to throw all that out the window and do their own thing. If you happen to enjoy our discussions and would like to contribute or get in contact with us, consider visiting our website at ourmidnightcake.com, liking, subscribing, and sharing the transmission with your friends. So as I stated before, I can only apologize. We've been promising idiocracy for so many weeks now. It won't be this week and it won't be next week. So join us as we will be discussing The Fellowship of the Ring, Peter Jackson's film adaptation. The Lord of the Rings. What is that? Um, no. <laughs> Who and knows? I, Who knows anymore, I, especially after that stupid Amazon series comes out. And I, I think it's safe to assume that both of us are fans of the movies. Oh, my gosh. And, yes. and we appreciate them. So much. I... I had no trouble going back and rewatching, like you say, the extended editions. <laughs> <laughs> I even watched the extended Hobbits. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sorry for that. So uh, discussing adaptation, I believe originally Peter Jackson brought 
this to the attention of New Line. I don't know who who all he went to before. With the intention of um, making two films is what I yes. had always heard. And that it was New Line that actually came back and insisted that it needed to be a trilogy. And this was a huge risk for any studio, uh, oh, yeah. if I remember correctly. One, adapting such a such an iconic series of books. S- something that had been labeled unfilmable? Yes. <laughs> and, and it was just understood that, no, this, this is not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And going from studio to studio, nobody wanted anything to do with it until this one guy said, yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. Mm-hmm. And not only wanting it to be a trilogy, but also having them film it all in succession. Which was so good for this trilogy to film it back and back, back to back to back like that with that continuity of filmmaking that could only come from that instead of it being just three separate productions. Even with the films, I I almost feel like it's not even appropriate to really call it a trilogy. It's one story throughout. And I guess that gets into like, what would you call a trilogy? Is a trilogy Mm -hmm. just three movies or is it, it, does it need to be three movies with a connected story or yeah. <laughs> so in that case, okay, this is a proper trilogy, but I, I you know, I, I can't imagine just watching one of these anymore. <laughs> like if you set out to watch The Fellowship, surely next week you're going to watch The Two Towers, you know, I mean. <laughs> Remember when we saw it in theaters for the first time? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and as soon as The Fellowship you- <laughs> ended, there was the whole uproar with everyone like, what the, you know. Like, you can tell who was not aware of the books. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I understand that uproar because, I mean, if you had gotten into it, you watched this wonderful film that just trailed off into nothing. <laughs> and and uh, you're not always guaranteed that sequel That's to true. follow that up. I want, like, how poorly would this have, have to have done for the sequel to somehow, like, surely they had already filmed everything for the sequel at that point. Yes. yeah. From what I understand, everything had already been filmed before the Fellowship of the Rings was released. Mm. So there was also a lot riding on this. Like, if the Fellowship doesn't do so well in the box office, then they have two more movies that they're just sitting on that they'll more than likely released just to make something back but mm. uh, actually uh, counting just by the middle of the uh the releases this is 20 years now isn't it yes um so i think uh, two yes. towers came out in 2002 didn't it i believe so okay cool well that doesn't make me feel old. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> two decades ago <laughs> I, I think I told you this, this movie. <laughs> I told you the conversation I had with the the younger person. The, there weren't as many great movies as as when he was young, mm-hmm. and his specific point of reference was Lord of the Rings. And I thought, yeah, I saw Lord of the Rings when I was young. But he was talking about like when he was like seven or five, you know, <laughs> and when he was not yet ten. And imagine that being your introduction to film, the freaking Lord of the Rings. I don't know if this would make sense to you. It's it's like the Wizard of Oz of our generation. Yeah, I, I yes, that, that does make sense to me. And I I can see that analogy. This is such a monumental undertaking and a it's the, the word epic gets thrown around much more than it should. But well, I it, mean, fortunately, the Lord of the Rings is this. literally an epic. <laughs> yes, yes, it is literally an epic and filmed as such. Oh, hey, here's Paca. Hey, I'm here, and I'm sorry I'm late. No, you're, you're fine. We're glad you, that you were able to join us. You're less late than everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I um, had a couple of thoughts. I, of course, um, am a purist when it comes to <laughs> two stories and things like that. I'm not a big fan of dinking around with the original <laughs> things. And <clears throat> that, that was a problem that I had with the lord of the rings some of it a lot of it was magnificent but the biggest difficulty i had with it was that the personalities of the characters were not the same between the movie and the book Mm, yeah they changed their interactions they changed how they behaved there was nothing jolly about the elves and, and yet in tolkien's world 
the elves laughed and played and joked about everything. And yet in the movie, they are just as dour and serious as they can be. And yet mm-hmm. in the original stories, uh, they're making fun of them when they come into to Rivendell and, you know, that sort of thing. Every one of them, you can you can take every one of the characters and see that their interrelationships, their age differences, the way they behaved, those kinds of things. Mary and Pippin were not anything like Mary and Pippin in the book. No, no. They were and, much and, more like young uh, rascals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, the friendships that they had with, uh, I mean, you got Mary and Pippin going along just because they're trying to escape something else in the movies. And in the book, they you couldn't have kept them away they were loyal to uh, to frodo uh sam you know if sam, i recall in the book it was the, it was almost planned that they would go with them up yeah. to a point at least yeah yeah that that was the whole thing well gandalf gandalf is just you know sort of doesn't quite know and he seems worried and everything gandalf in the book is very stalwart and very sure of himself and very confident throughout the entire thing anyway there's there's just there's I know uh, Christopher Lee was really upset at what they did with Saruman and how he dies, because in the book, you still have the Battle of the Shire. Right. And he has gone to the Shire and has taken it over in order to just twist the knife. You know, they have to go and they have to liberate it. And, and his death in the book is amazing. He floats up and he rises up as and he turns into sort of this mist and gets blown away. And they missed out on on so much. I realize you have to take some you know license adapting something from a book to a movie i read that uh, the thing with the scouring of the shire was that they had decided that they just could not get away with more than four endings they had to cut the fifth ending out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's that you know <laughs> I think it's amazing that, that the book ever got finished or the books. Well, it, it's oh, really yeah. one, yeah. one book divided in three. It's not a trilogy. As a purist, that's something that, that drives me nuts. Is when people talk about Tolkien's trilogy, and I say, oh, what trilogy is that? And they say, well, The Lord of the Rings. And I say, no, it's one book. You just separate it into three volumes, but it's not three separate I, I, I said a similar thing about the movies was that how could you just watch one section of it? Yeah, it wouldn't make any sense. If you look at, say, the Harry Potter movies, those are separate stories. Each one's a year at the school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they're separate until you get to the end, of course. There's a very loose continuity, but especially with the movies, since they were finished before the books were, it's hard to say that the first one is terribly connected to the last one. Hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Or maybe maybe you wouldn't say it's terribly connected. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, if they, they kept changing directors, and so the the school changes, the uh, everything changes. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the characters change, the the tone characters changes. Change. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing. But going back to uh, the Lord of the Rings, the story behind the writing of it, I I just really loved. It was uh, C.S. Lewis that finally convinced Tolkien to. He he kept writing him saying, "You've got to finish this. You've got to finish this." And it, it took Tolkien what twelve years, I think, because. The Hobbit was originally written as a children's story. And then he starts on The Lord of the Rings. And it becomes this involved thing where he would stop. If he couldn't figure out how something was done, if he couldn't figure out how the elves would have lit a fire or whatever it is, then he would stop writing. He wouldn't just, you know, put a little footnote in there, you know, add how you start a fire and move on. He had to stop and he had to research. He had to figure out how a fire would have been lit. And then he would put that in and then he'd move on. I guess that's something else that really drives me nuts about changing the story so much. You know, don't even get me started on the Hobbit. (laughs) (laughs) But so, so you didn't like you didn't like Tariel. (laughs) I watched the first Hobbit movie, and then that was it. I wasn't going back for any of the rest of that. It was just so much foolishness. Once they got into the Goblin Caves. And, you know, the, the whole thing was, well, you got me started on the hub. The whole thing was, <laughs> the whole thing was built for 3D. Mm, yes. You know, and, and, and that's what drives me nuts about 3D movies is that by design, you have to throw in things that come at you, you know, that come out of the screen. And that's fine if it's in context with the film but or, or the story. But but what they did here was they, they took it was a series of tunnels and they made it this great big open cavern with a roller coaster ride. It didn't work in the second Indiana Jones movie, The Temple of Doom, and it certainly doesn't work in this movie. It, why would anybody be that, uh, 
I can't even think of the right word. What, uh, uh, egotistical? I don't know. To to say, well, yeah, you know, the 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 Lord of the Rings is is a nice story, but you know what I think it needs. You know, I mean, <laughs> that comes Black back dwarves. To, it it oh. goes back. <laughs> wrestling. That's what we need. Dwarf mud wrestling. Are you talking uh, about space? <laughs> 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 I see it. A line of chorus girls. <laughs> Black hat. Uh, oh. <laughs> Two, three, oh, kick, turn, 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 turn. turn. <laughs> We're fans of the producers. <laughs> if you could just CGI out the uh, book, we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the uh, wanting a Star Trek movie. You know, we, we kept mm. hearing about there was going to be a Star Trek movie. There's going to be a Star Trek movie. There's going to be, you know, and of course that didn't happen until after I was married. You know? <laughs> and of course, at the same time, you know, everyone was always talking about making a film version of The Hobbit, making a film version of The Lord of the Rings. And, and it was just always sort of the, that word that you'd hear those rumors. And of course, wasn't happening, wasn't happening. When we finally found out that, uh, that Peter Jackson was making the uh, The Lord of the Rings and a friend of mine and I, you know, got online and we started seeing the artwork for it, which was amazing uh, artwork that wh whoever the artist was that was doing it was just masterful. And you started seeing these images come up and the, those two enormous statues with their arms out, you know, as the, as the little uh, boat is going between them. And, and mm. a, a lot of these images that were, that were just unbelievably stunning. And so we were so excited for it. And then it came out. And, you know, when I first saw it, I was wowed by it. But then, of course, you take the time to think about it afterwards and maybe see it again and, you know, that sort of thing. And then after a while, I started feeling like I started feeling let down. I don't know. You know, you you can complain about the Mona Lisa if you want to. You know, there's always something that you can say, <laughs> well, I don't know. She's fine, but there's something wrong with that smile. You know, And so... I don't want to be one of those that is just going to find fault with something. I think the thing that bothers me is that it is now the production of The Lord of the Rings. I don't see anybody else coming along and redoing it. Not in my lifetime. <laughs> so it has to stand as the example, as, as the filmed version of a great masterpiece. And I well, guess do, you, do you think it could have been done better? Like I mentioned before, my my big complaint mm -hmm. is in the characterizations in right, right. Okay. how they were directed and how they interacted with each other. The story lost the purpose of the story, which is the interaction between all of these different characters from all of these different worlds. You know, you have elves and, and mm -hmm. dwarves and, and uh, wizard and, you know, um, hobbits and mortals and, and all this different stuff going on. I don't mind the artistic license in, say, having the army of the dead actually get off the ships and wipe everything out and that sort of stuff. They, they don't do that in the book. But that doesn't make any difference to me. That's fine. What bothers me is, for instance, Aragorn, throughout the movie, he... He doesn't see himself as becoming king, and, 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 and he seems like he's not up to it and all that. Throughout the books, he knows he's going to be king, mm -hmm. and he's built for it. I think the thing ultimately that really ruined it for me is that the whole, that whole series, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, all of it really has to do with, with Bilbo's home, Bag End. All of that has to do with the Shire and with specifically Bag End. And, and the reason why I say that is it's all Bilbo thought, thinks about and talks about throughout The Hobbit is him mm. getting back home, not unlike The Wizard of Oz. You know, In The Lord of the Rings, the whole thing is that Frodo has been given this magnificent place. They are people of means. And he has a gardener named Sam who comes along with him, who is a lesser person. He is not of the same status as Frodo would be. And he is his servant. And throughout the beginning of the book, he calls him master all the time. Mm -hmm. In the end, when Frodo goes off to the West with Gandalf and the others, and, and they're in the boat and he's about to leave, he gives Sam the keys to bag in, which means, you know, in thanksgiving for Sam saving him, numerous times throughout the whole thing and being so humble and being so terrific and, and, and being, you know, the perfect servant, 
he elevates him to the most important home in the Shire right. and gives him Bag Inn. And it's this amazing moment which reminded me a great deal of World War I, where you had people from all these different backgrounds suddenly in trenches together, firing together on an enemy. You had, you had very poor English and very wealthy English and, and the children of lords and ladies and the children of the scullery maid and all that. And suddenly they were even in the trenches and they got to know each other. And when they came back, it had changed that whole aristocracy forever in, to a certain measure. And then it happened again in World War II. And then, you know, of course, taxation did its part. But to me, that's the crux of the story. And Peter Jackson threw that out. And that's something that will forever bother me about it because it doesn't have, not only does it not have the charm of the books, but it doesn't have the statement of the books. In the movie, uh, Frodo gives uh, Sam the book. And then Sam goes home and he goes back into his own little place with his wife. And that's it. And, and I sat there going, uh, no! No! <laughs> <laughs> the most important moment where Bilbo gives Sam bag end, where Sam worked all this time and now suddenly he owns it. That that is is huge, and that wasn't important. That that wasn't worthy of an ending. That wasn't. I. It, it just. And see, how many people have I talked to about the movie? Who didn't even know there was a book? Oh. <laughs> and so to them, the movie is the story rather than the charm and the grace and the magnificence of the book. Therein lies my my criticism and my complaint. I think that's certainly valid. I know. Now now that I've listened to you, I, I'm not even worried about the Amazon series. Peter Jackson already ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Still be worried about this Amazon series. It's gonna be it's gonna be horrendous trash. <laughs> oh man. Thank you for joining us in the dimension of our midnight cape. We hope you'll visit us again. From myself, Lumberdor, Beaches, and Doug, thank you, and good night. I first read The Lord of the Rings, uh, I think I started it when I was a freshman in high school. So that would have been 1972. Okay. Of course, just, you know, raced through them from book to book to book, getting them from the, the school library. Um, For me, it was junior high. So that would have been like, what, mid 90s, I think. So not even really that long before the films got made. I didn't mm. have to wait long at all. Aren't you jealous? <laughs> <laughs> well, and then I have to think about how many times I'd read it between the first time and the movies, you know. So well, as I admitted to Saltus, when I first read it, I was not as impressed. I was more of a sci-fi person. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I will say I recognized I was reading something great. Well, thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> Thumbs up for not being a literary moron. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and you know, there's there's a lot of literature out there that it takes time thinking about it afterward. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was that way with, and I'm still not sure how I feel about it, but um, Jojo Rabbit mm. is, is one of those movies that I watched it and I walked out of it thinking, okay. Was that a comedy? Was that a satire? Was that, it was like six different things and it couldn't quite decide which one it wanted to be. And, and uh, I, it, it was a film that caused me to really deeply think about it, which I think is, is one of the signs of a good film is that you, you know, you spend time really thinking about it afterwards. Um, it means some Same guy who made Love and Thunder Solstice. <laughs> yes, I know. It's amazing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jojo Rabbit, arguably his best film. I, uh, I still like I still like Hunt for the Wilder People. 
That's that's good too. Like mm. he's done wonderful things. I think that he will continue to do wonderful things if they're his own things. 